Ever since I was about three years old, I wondered, what happens if you try to load websites from space? So on the 31st of June 2018, I recruited a ragtag group of misfits and told them, just go beyond the reach of the moon, out of Earth's orbit, and try to access some websites that you're usually going to access. And after great expense and two weeks, then they, they sent me a tape. I never heard from them again, and later learned that they just dumped the mission computer in the third level basement car park and left it recording for five days. Uh, but it was much like what you would have seen from space. This is that video. Shit. Uh, this, is, this is pretty much what it's like to use the internet in most of space. Now, the ISS has quite slow internet. It's not very good. Uh, but most other areas of space, anywhere beyond pretty much outside of Earth's orbit, then you're pretty stuck. And I thought, kind of, how, what's, what's wrong here? Why does that matter? Like, do we even, sorry, we. So, but other than, I thought, kind of, I'm not likely to go to space anytime soon. But why is our offline support still so bad? If I, I don't think it's very fair that this is what astronauts are going to see. Those guys work really hard. Um, but this is also what offline's like for us here on Earth. So if you're in that level three basement car park, this is what you get. There's plenty of other places where you're offline. We'll go into those soon. And I think we can do a better job than this. But the question that you often ask when you're told to add offline support is, is, is it worth it? It's not free. It takes effort. We're pretty lazy. Don't want to add it. So this question conveniently breaks down into three parts. So we can go into those a part at a time. We have what's offline? Who, who are these weirdos that want to use the web offline? And why do they want to do it? What's offline support? What does it mean to support a website offline? And is it worth it? It's, as I said, it's not free. It's very cheap. It's easy. But there's some caveats, there's some challenges, there's some hard shit that we haven't figured out yet. So we'll get to that. And is, we're just going to ignore. That's not an important part of the question. So firstly, who and where is offline? Uh, we're just going to do a little, little vision experiment. I want you to shut your eyes for a moment and just imagine you're at your front door at home. And you open your door. Your eyes are open in real life, obviously. But anyway, So you, you open your door, you step outside, you start walking, and then you glance up at the sky. There's kind of some ominous gray clouds. And you think, mm, I'm going to check the weather. I might go back and get an umbrella. So you take out your phone and you check the weather first. And your phone just starts spinning and spinning. And you realize you're at that boundary of your house, maybe 10, 15 meters from the front door. And you've just been burned by Li-Fi. This is where your phone thinks it still has internet reception, but when it actually tries to access anything, you learn that it's far too slow and just unusable. So you're stuck. Uh, you can probably just go back inside, but this, is, this hits me all the time for weather things, train timetables, the kind of stuff that you check when you leave your house. But you don't even have to leave your house to get this kind of shitty internet. This can happen to you inside your house. You've got dead spots in there. You've probably got a corner that your Wi-Fi doesn't reach. Uh, if you're in the kitchen, you've got interference in the microwave. If you've got a really small house and great Wi-Fi coverage, maybe one day you leave your phone in your pants pocket and put them in the washing machine. That's like a modern-day Faraday cage, and it's just metal surroundings. You'll never find it again. And by the time you do, it's too late and ruined. Trust me. So we can, we can go a bit beyond that, though. There's, so Li-Fi is one kind of disconnection. That's like a super weak connection. There's a lot of other kinds of offline offline Uh This one, I don't even know what to call it. This is full reception and full Wi-Fi, but a little X next to the Wi-Fi indicator and means no internet. This is a confusing one. This happens if you don't log into networks and things, then you, you get something like this. I don't have a catchy name for it, but uh, it's just another kind of offline that you're going to hit. This photo was taken yesterday. The third type, we'll, we'll go beyond our houses. We step outside into the real world and taking trains. So trains and planes are two great examples of where we have offline. Trains, 
You've got good reception along a lot of parts of the line, but a couple of places that you encounter issues. One, if you're getting some kind of regional rail far inland, then you've got big dead spots of no internet. You don't expect it because it's just farms and stuff, but it's pretty annoying if you're trying to work on a two-hour train ride to Bairnsdale. I don't know where people take trains. The other one that you hit much more commonly is on suburban lines and loops and things. And anytime you get near a big station, then you'll often stop just outside the station while they're doing signaling stuff and changing the tracks. And there's a lot of overhead lines and these sort of things there. And then you've got no reception again. And that's often where you spend quite a bit of time, just sitting there with no signal and not usable. Planes as well, that's like a 10 plus hour time where you have either no Wi-Fi or you can choose to pay a lot of money for awful Wi-Fi. And neither of these is a very compelling option. And beyond that, travel. Like, even anywhere in the country, Australia does not have great internet. Uh, this tweet was from earlier this year when some telco decided to try to stream the World Cup. Uh, it didn't go well. We learned that our, our infra is not really up to it. Our internet's not really good. Prime Minister had to get involved. It was, it was a whole thing. But uh, it, it hasn't helped, because it was shortly after the Prime Minister was involved, they claimed to fix everything. I ran a speed test at my house about a week after. Got this. This is a whopping 0 0.02 megabits per second download speed. Uh, the upload didn't finish, because that was too slow. Uh, and I, I don't really know what to do about it. I don't want to move. That's, I'm not going to move just for fast internet. Uh, I'm waiting. Uh, several more years for faster internet to come to my area. So I'm just kind of stuck with this. This was just something you've got to deal with. I can just go somewhere else. So I came to the conference and thought I'd run a speed test. This internet's ridiculously fast. And I thought, sweet, I can just live here for the rest of my life. <laughs> internet here is pretty solid. But immediately after taking this speed test, then I tried loading a website and still got this spinny. And this isn't anything on the NDC website. This just happened for a bunch of them. I was messing around with some DNS things, and then this happened. But the reason is it's not just about raw download power. There's, there's a bunch of other stuff that has to happen. As we may know, the internet is complicated, and a lot of stuff happens in it. When you make a request, then you're, you're going through kind of DNS might not be working. Uh, your, the server you're trying to access might be down. Any other one of the 1,015 things required for a connection could go wrong and cause a slow connection. And to the end user, they don't know how any of that shit works. They just think they're offline and doesn't work. And they get the broken dinosaur. So there's other reasons to be offline. That was all the forced ones that we can't control. But there are some that we can. There's reasons to choose to be offline. And attention is a good one. That dangling colon's really disconcerting. I don't know how it got there. but. Um, so while we're online, it's kind of a stream of constant distraction. You'll start doing something, you'll have a random thought, you'll Google it, that'll be interesting, you just read about that for a while, and then it's three days later and you haven't really done anything you were supposed to be doing, just through distraction. Alternatively, maybe you're just getting spammed with messages all the time, or you're just constantly wanting to check your email. There's a lot of these kind of things that are just our, we've just kind of gotten used to them. And we just push the idea of being online all the time as an overwhelmingly good thing. But if you actually want to get some work done, then it's sometimes good to be offline. This is a great demo of an offline-only page from Chris Bowen. So you go to this page, and you have to disconnect your internet. You can go in emulated mode if you really need to be online all the time. Also, probably seek counseling. But if you just turn off your Wi-Fi, then you just get, and it's basically an article talking about the hazards of being online all the time. And I made a similar thing just for my own use. I've got kind of a notepad that had focus mode that would previously make it full screen. And now I've just got a mode like this, just to kind of force yourself to disconnect if you want to write some stuff down without getting distracted. And the other choice, I've, this is GitLab. I, I work for GitLab. I skipped an About Me slide, so we'll just do it at the 10-minute mark. Uh, GitLab is a remote-only company with 
300 and something employees in 45 countries. So we're, we're pretty widely distributed. I realized just after finding this image that we now have employees from Australia to Zimbabwe, which is cool. But um, we're, we're all pretty widely spread out. And I, I like, I fucking love working remote. It's fantastic. I, am I allowed to swear? I, I'm doing it. That shit sailed. And so I, I like taking remote work unnecessarily literally and just going to places where there's often not internet. Uh, haven't been here, but just places like this. This was just a nice looking image of a lake. And you just can go out somewhere. There's plenty of places you can find without internet and just go and sit down and work for a couple of hours, just write code quietly. Uh, GitLab sadly does not have offline support yet. We'll, we'll get there. A bit more on that later. But we've seen that Basically, offline isn't an error. Offline is something that happens to people everywhere, all the time. Probably everyone in this room has been offline at some point. And it's just reflective of real life. This is network conditions, this is reality, this is choosing to be offline, anything else. And as such, we should deal with it. This is on us as developers to make it better than just an error page. So how do we support it? What is offline support? What can we possibly even do to fix the dinosaur page? Uh, I asked esteemed author, Kurt Vonnegut, what he thought of software of today. And uh, he answered me with this quote from Play Piano of worse than ever, but there's hope. And I asked, Kurt, why are you so negative? Why are you so down on software? This is great. And he just said, do you remember when software was like this? This was a glorious piece of software from the late 90s to early 2000s. This met kind of all of my visual and audio needs. This is Winamp for anyone that's not familiar. It was a music player that you download one time and then never need the internet to use it again. You can just add your music there, you can listen to things, you can EQ it, it does, it does all the things that we expect good software to do. And um, the visualization thing, it's, it's just kind of they respond to the music, it's, it's fantastic. This was good software. And yet we come to 21 years later and we've kind of, we've improved the distribution situation. You get instant updates with websites and web apps and things, but the offline support is significantly worse than this, where you kind of load it once and then you come back again and have to load it all again. So, what is, if you try to load a site offline, we saw what the default experience is like. You just get the no internet guy, the dinosaur. Chrome's experience is not terrible. They've got a bit of information, they've got a little game here. You can get a cake, your dinosaur's powered up, got a party hat, and running along. So this is not terrible. But the problem with this game is no matter how long you play it, I've played it a lot as research, <laughs> but every time you're gonna lose. And so no matter how fun the game is, it's unwinnable. And when you lose, then you're just stuck with a shocked looking dinosaur with a party hat and a cactus up his ass. This is basically like, like not giving an offline experience. This is what you're offering people. We can do better than that, surely. So that's for a full page load. What if you're on a page already and then the Wi-Fi gets disconnected and then some code like this gets run? So we have fetch something and as we know, always handle success, but we're gonna look at this code. And this code usually looks something like this. Uh, we just kind of, we figure, eh, error is not very important, we're just gonna show them an error message. So to a user, that just looks like this. They see a red bar on the page. Not very informative, not very useful, that's not great. Uh, worse than that, and probably as common, is the old empty cache block. We, uh, yeah, and to a user that looks like this. Just kind of, they won't know why stuff isn't working, it'll just break silently, and they don't really know what to do, or why nothing is working. So, we can improve both of these situations. Service workers are fundamental to a lot of this. They're not required for all offline support, but we're gonna kind of dive into them anyway. They're, they're key for most things. So, a service worker is, we'll, we'll look at the original way you connect to the internet. It's something like this. You've got a laptop and some dotted lines in the world. I, I don't really know how it all works. Um, the service worker is basically just goes in between here. So the first time you visit a site, it installs a service worker in your browser and that's then there all the time available. So even if they close your tab, then the service worker can still do stuff. It's just some JavaScript that gets run all the time and can respond to requests. And you can use it as kind of a network proxy. So any request that you make to the site 
first it goes through the service worker and the service worker can choose to do stuff or just send the request through. So in case something like this happens and the internet goes down, then your requests just go to the service worker. It'll say, ah, yeah, Earth's exploded. So it'll just serve requests itself. And so inside this, also no one knows what it looks like, but it's always just drawn as a gear or a box. I don't know why that is, but if you've got a good logo for a service worker, then please find me later. So that's, that's the gist of how it works. It just runs code and can intercept network requests and do stuff. So the first thing that we'll do with that is replace static content. We'll just get rid of the dinosaur page and put something of our own there. And people really like the dinosaur page. They'll say, you know, don't get rid of a sweet game and some messages and stuff. Why are you doing these things? But that's, this is like a good first step. If you want, you can put your logo here, get your error page on brand. Um, but this is from WhatsApp. They're quite a large company now. And this is all they have on their offline page. They consider this OK. Uh, this is good enough for Zuckerberg, then it's probably fine for us. He's OK'd it. Um, and this is honestly like if people aren't using Chrome, this is Safari's error page. So it's on par with that. And you've now got a service worker in place so you can add other stuff. So if you want to step zero and do nothing else today, you can get your kind of static page with about six lines of text. That's a good start, but we can add some more content than that. If, if you still want to give people a game, there's plenty of examples of games. You can, so on your offline page, you can load any content you want. You're just running code. This is Travago's example, and there's a bunch of good things on this page, and some that I'm not so big on. So they have at the top a countdown that will count down from 15 seconds and then try refreshing the page. Um, there's a reconnect if you don't want to wait that long, and then there's a maze. Uh, the maze is pretty elaborate, pretty good. Uh, that was as far as I got though, and then I got bored and went and did something else. And that's usually how it goes with most of these things. No matter how fun your fallback activity is, it's probably not what the person came here to see. When I went to Trivago this time, I didn't come here to solve a maze. I came here to do whatever they do in their business. Hotels. I came here for hotels. <laughs> and there's a bunch of other examples. The Guardian, for a while, had a crossword page on their developer blog. This was like the famous service worker offline example. Uh, a few months after launching this, so this is still what goes in kind of this was the canonical demo, but a couple of months after they pulled it and they have open sourced all their code. So I went looking through and thought, why did you remove this? And they said basically no one was using it and it was downloading a bunch of crossword code for everyone. So your static offline page gets downloaded for everyone that gets your service worker, which means if you're loading like a 60 meg maze game in the background, that's going to everyone even though 0.1% of people are going to end up using it and actually being offline. So they made the responsible move to pull the maze. And it's kind of a trade-off there. You can choose if you want to give people something to do, but then also the fact that most people won't do it, then it's not really worth hiding Easter eggs in there and just causing people to download a bunch of code that they don't want. What do they want? Skips too early, but they want content. So content. I think of, imagine walking into a bakery, and this is the baker, he's not wearing an apron right now, but he, he's holding a loaf of bread in his hands as you walk in. And you say, please, Philip, I'd like that loaf of bread. And he says, sure. And then he goes back behind the counter, he puts it in a paper bag, tosses the bag in the bin, and then goes out the back, he's on his bench, tosses some flour out, gets some new flour, gets some water, gets some yeast, He's rolling the dough, he's rolling it with an iron, and uh, you can't see any of this because you're still out the front just waiting for him. So for 95 minutes while the bread cooks, you're just looking at something like this. And then once the bread's ready, he brings it out and he says, bam, fresh bread, just what you wanted. And this seems like a kind of ridiculous and contrived example. Um, so I thought I'd go to the bakery of the internet and see what they do. And pretty much exactly like the bakery example. So I came to Reddit looking for some fresh content. And I go, oh, OK, cool. And then I just refresh the page straight away. And I would have thought, given I just saw the exact same content, that it could just be there. But I get the same quite lengthy loading time each time because we're obsessed with just grabbing the freshest available content at all times because we think it's critical. And this is pretty frustrating. We can, most of your content isn't going to change that often. Even if it does, stale content is worth more to me than a little pulsing alien. 
So please save things that you see. This is the first step of getting better than just a static page. To find good examples of this, uh, I just look at the blogs of developers and stuff and see what they do. Uh, this is Jeremy Keith's online home. He has a bunch of journal articles and blogs and things. And whenever you visit one of these, and that's saved. So this, the page content of this, you can then access offline the next time you try to use it. And that's quite great. That just means any page I visited, I can then go back to at any time on a plane or in space or anywhere that I want to be and just read about taking back the web. And this is quite straightforward to do. This is kind of the next simplest possible approach is just saving content. Um, issue that we have with this is that when you load it while you're offline, you don't have any indication that you're offline because it seems to be working fine. So you read through, again, you scroll to the bottom of the page and you hit some links and you think, oh, sweet, I want to view older links. And so you click that and then you just get back to back to our old error page. Maybe if you've got a fallback page, then you'll hit that, but we don't have this saved. So for that, we can pre-cache. You could say, if we land on this particular post, then load an older and a newer post, and then people have somewhere to go from here, and we're kind of loading a little bit of content ahead of time for them. Um, if you're not sure what things people click, there's a pretty cool recent framework called Guess.js that does you feed it a bunch of analytics data, and then it'll give you kind of, if someone's on this page, here's the most likely pages they're gonna visit. So you could intelligently preload. You could say, if someone reads this article, 90% chance that they're gonna then go to this article. And you've then kind of preloaded stuff that they're actually likely to do. So more intelligent than just blindly loading content like a next and previous page, and just kind of more useful. They have an example of this with a bunch of Wikipedia pages. So this is reading about cheese, cheese steaks, and cheese the recreational drug, which I didn't know was a thing. But um, this just loads. So if you land on the cover page for cheese, and that just gives you the content of those first 10 pages. And you'll notice here that the images aren't working. And that's because we're offline. So we're just getting, just having pre-cached the text. You're, you can preload images if you want to, uh, but we'll get to that very shortly about just, you don't want to be pushing tens of megabytes of data to people's phones without them asking or without them knowing. So even if you're offering kind of, you're giving them five pages, then they're going to hit somewhere where you haven't saved the page and then you're going to need your fallback again. So worst case, you can just have again, your shit maze or whatever you want to have. Um, better example is listing things that they can do that are relevant. So this is Ethan Marcotte's blog, and if you land on a page you haven't been to before and don't have cached, this says you're currently offline, but that's okay. Thanks, Ethan. Just reassuring you and then saying, here's some things that we have saved, and you've got some stuff that you can read. And this is likely very related to the stuff that I wanted to read and relevant content. And this is a pretty good improvement, and you've then got something to do. Uh, if you don't have anything available, then you can show your fallback page, but this is a better first point. Um, some more on bread. This, if you do really want to offer fresh bread all the time, then you can just tell people when the content is stale. If you're, so you load content first, this is from uh, Phil Nash's blog, who's also speaking here. And when you load the, his front page, it loads instantly. And then you come back next time in, after a couple of months, and if there's stale content on there, then it'll just tell you. You get a notification saying there's stale content, click for the freshest. And that's a much better way to update than just assuming people want the freshest content all of the time and throwing away everything that you've worked so hard to serve them the first time. And if you do have a small site, so this works for if you're not a prolific blogger and just have 10 posts, or if you're writing docs, or if you have a small static site, or anything that's, or standalone application even, something that they've loaded already and they have everything they need, then you can just save all of it. You can preload the content. The Lodash docs are one of the most amazing docs I've ever experienced. This video was recorded on a plane at altitude without Wi-Fi and I was just reading about how Dropwire works. You've got, they save four different versions of the docs. 
And this is a, that's about, I think that's 40 or 50K each. So that's kind of a reasonable amount of data to push to someone the first time they visit. But that means the first time you visit the Lodash docs, you never need to go there again until they release a major version or something, I guess. But this is the kind of experience that you can go for if you have a docs page. This is a instantly loading, reliable, fast page every time after the first time that they've loaded it. And, but as I said earlier, be considerate with what you're pushing. So docs pages that are kind of tens or like tens or hundreds of K, okay. Uh, once we start getting into bigger content, like huge images, you don't want to be pushing a three meg hero image from five articles because you think people would read it. Uh, you don't want to be pushing a 60 meg game for your offline page because you think it'd be a fun Easter egg. Your, this is stuff that's loading in the background. The idea is it's completely invisible to the user. So you need to just use your best interests. There's, you might get kind of a bit of push from your, your marketing or other people to say, you know, enable offline analytics and serve offline ads and anything else. Like, don't do that. Just say it can't be done. Invent a technical reason that it can't be done. And please don't do offline ads. I regret mentioning that. But uh, for bigger things, if you do have like a large app that you want to make available offline when they choose to, or if you have videos and other data like that, that is just something that you think, not everyone wants this, some people want to be able to access it offline. Then you can just try a toggle switch. You just give people a thing, say it's this many meg, and click here to download. Um, this then has the benefit of if they don't want it anymore, or they want some more space on their device, and they can just flick the switch off, and then it'll be deleted. And this is a pretty good way to handle big files or full sites or other things like that. Um, but there's more than just static data. We want to be able to do more than just read while offline. I want to be able to go and do a code review and leave a bunch of comments and submit forms and this kind of stuff that I usually do while I'm offline without it just erroring out. And my kind of, I don't know if you call it favorite, this was a, a thing that happened Here's a simulation of it. I just finished a really long survey on my laptop. It's on a phone because it's a simulation. But then you, uh, you hit submit on a Google form when you're offline, and you get this. And then you panic, and you hit back, and you get this. <laughs> and it's, there's, that's gone. That was hundreds of questions. I'd spent hours, and now it's gone. Even in the best case, if you hit back and go to a form, you get a pretty confusing dialogue saying resend or cancel. And I'm never sure if you hit cancel, then nothing appears to happen. And then you hit back again, and then you, I don't know. It's a confusing dialogue, maybe better than this, maybe worse. But this is not good. This is the default experience of offline forms, and it's horrendous. And this butcher, I missed a talk submission because of this. And we can do better than that. We want better offline forms. Forms, are, it's a pretty simple thing. It's just like some text and a button. So what can we do? The first step you can do, this is an easy mode thing. This doesn't need service workers. This you can just use navigator.online to check if they're connected. And when they're offline, then you can just disable the form fields. Uh, this is back to Trivago again. They show you a little bloop down the bottom and then gray out the fields. And this prevents me from messing up my form submission. Um, but it can also be a little confusing. There's no tooltip explaining why these fields are grayed out. I don't really know what's going on right now. I'm just frantically clicking around the top section trying to do my search query. And there's not really an explanation there. So you can do this. It's good to explain it. But there's, there's better ways to do it. Disabling form fields and buttons is usually annoying. Some stores are into this approach. They think when we're offline, we'll disable or hide prices and add to cart buttons. But again, I just find that really confusing. It's your kind of hiding information that should be there and you have available and you're just choosing not to display it. So a better approach is just retry the submission. This is an easy thing. This covers a lot of, like if you just get in a lift and hit submit and then the lift doors close and your connection drops and then the thing fails. Um, but if you just retry. So type form forms look like this. If you're disconnected and you submit a type form, form, then it says you don't appear to be online, we'll retry in a few seconds, um, or retry now. That's, people like having the button to skip the countdown for some reason. But 
this is, again, very good. This will solve like a lot of, if there's intermittent connectivity, if you've got like bad internet or cables not plugged in properly or you're at the edge of Wi-Fi and it's just dropping periodically, then this will be fine. Um, this means only downside of this is if they close the tab, then they lose their data. So they need to stay on the page. So your message needs to be either clear or obtrusive enough that they're not going to leave while it's in progress. And we'll just talk about loading spinners for a second while we're on indicators. Um, I find these very unsettling. This is the thing, when you start exploring into how sites work offline, then you see a lot of this. And it kind of, it's like the modern day version of the Windows copy dialog where it says five seconds remaining, but there's thousands of files, so you know it's not gonna be five seconds. Then it says 30 seconds remaining, you're like, yeah, that's more realistic. Then it says two minutes remaining, and then it goes back to five seconds remaining, then finishes. It's just, you don't know when that's gonna end. This one doesn't end. Um, this is the kind of thing you see at the end of infinite scroll sites. So if you scroll down to the bottom and you keep scrolling, like, unsplash, give me my bread. But it doesn't, it just keeps on spinning. And so handling that is similar to handling form failures. You, you can kind of just say, you're disconnected, we can't load any more content now. There's probably some here, come back later. Just some kind of message or something that's just not a spinner that looks like stuff is still coming. Um, because, yeah, I'll just, I'll just sit and look at it for a while and wait. I think maybe you're going to load. I don't know what's happening here. And a lot of pages do this. They'll have either a loading spinner or some skeleton placeholders things. And, and we can, that's a, it's an easy one to fix. Just catch errors and then display a message. But so better than retrying and better than disabling fields is limited availability for now. So this is just a newer browsers thing. But it will soon be everywhere, I'm sure. This, this depends on service workers and is background sync. It's a newish web API, and the name is pretty self-descriptive. It's basically background sync. So instead of the form submission happening in the foreground, then when you submit a form, then you can try. And if that fails, then you tell your service worker, hey, can you sync this in the background? And the benefit of that over just regular retry is that you can close the tab. And that's pretty cool in that I can just fill out a form and then close the tab and trust that it's going to be submitted later when I'm next available, which is just super convenient. If you just drop your phone into your pocket and walk somewhere else, then it'll sort itself out. Um, this does introduce the difficulty of what if something goes wrong? What if I want to show them an error message? If I want to, or say everything's okay. So then you need to use push notifications as well. That's the only way you have of communicating with them if they've closed the tab, is to send a push notification. And the downside of sending a push notification, if you send it while they're online, but they don't check their phone, and then they go offline, they go into, uh, back here, I don't know what's back there, there's probably no internet. But, so you go into the spot with no internet, and then you check your phone, and you're like, oh sweet, I got a push notification. So you hit it, it disappears, and then it opens an error page, and then you've lost the push notification, and you're stuck here, probably gonna close the tab, and then you don't know how to get back here. So if you're going to send people somewhere from a push notification, then please make that page work offline or have a fallback so that they're at least not losing information that you're trying to send them. Like what if this was an order confirmation or something? So, and that is about it for push notifications. We have offline indicators are the other thing. This is when you're using the site and you have, you saw it on the Trivago example, the little box that pops up telling you you're offline. Uh, people like having these. They like having a little toast thing that pops up and just says you're offline. I'm of two minds because this is the Trivago one. It has a reconnect button. And I tried the reconnect button and it didn't reconnect me for obvious reasons in that I was offline. But this can, like, given it, it'll automatically reconnect when you're back online. So giving people this button is not entirely necessary. I guess it gives them something to do, but... You, you often don't need to give them this kind of information. And in the case of for forms and stuff, like you, you'll see this is used quite a lot, the notification thing of you're offline. Um, but often it doesn't matter. If I'm filling out a big form, the only time connectivity matters is when I click submit. Prior to that, I can be offline. I could be sitting in a bunker somewhere, just frantically filling out this form, and then I run outside and hit submit. And I don't care about being offline any of that time until I actually need connectivity. So. For notifications, you're better off just to show them when it's actually relevant. So this one is, I just didn't like the button. Um, 
they also, the risk of the offline ones is too much information. Um, this was one that told me when I had no network connection or not. And for some reason, it just sent me a bunch of them in a row. Um, this is, again, something you want to avoid. Like, none of that mattered to me. The thing seemed fine. I was streaming music or something from here. And it wasn't interrupted at all, but I just got a flash of about 12 notifications. So another thing not to do is just spam people with messages that don't interest them. Um, so we've done static pages. We've done forms. We want to look at more complex applications. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, you can, if you've loaded the page onto someone's device, then you have you can just freely store that. You've got quite a bit of storage available to use, so most of your app code can just run in there. Um, so the WinApp example earlier is actually a web app that works offline and is one of the greatest things I've seen in my entire life. Um, this is, you just go to webamp.org and load this up, and then you can reload it again. It, you can load music from your local computer onto it and play it, and it just works like a music player in your browser and works offline all of the time. And that's pretty amazing. You can get kind of pretty much full functionality of any apps that you're using. Um, and we have multiplayer forms, the other kind of common application. So this is stuff like chat. This is how Hangouts would handle failed messages. This is not very good. Come on, Larry. You're better than this. Uh, Google do a lot of great stuff offline. This is one of the worst examples of theirs I could find. This is bad because it's just a message doesn't have a retry button. Like the one thing you want in chat is a retry button. Because if I just see nope, message not delivered, I'm just going to write nope again and try sending it. And then eventually either one of them will get through or about six of them will, and you just get a bunch of duplicated messages up there when you do connect. So we can do better chat than this. We can, there's a couple of options for you. So chat is an example where you would want to show an indicator because that's people expect that they are connected. So if they're disconnected, then give some sort of notification that they're offline. WhatsApp does a pretty great job of this. They have this little yellow box up the top left that when you disconnect, that guy pops up and says you're not connected. Please try reconnecting. Um, you can still send messages. So you can see by, this was me talking to my son. And there's a little clock there down next to the message. And this guy. And that just says, this is pending. It'll send next time we connect. And when you do connect, then it does get sent. But better than that is if you send a message that you regret while you're offline, then you can delete it. And then you can delete that message. And then you can just send another message. And then when you connect, then it will send them all in order and delete the message that you didn't want your son to see. And this is, this is done pretty well. I tested this moderately hard. And I found the only thing, only issue I found with this was if you delete a message for all and then delete it for you, and then you can delete it for yourself again, and then when you reconnect, then you get a kind of confusing error about not being able to delete the message. Um, I wouldn't really worry about that. That's a kind of beyond offline edge case that you need and care about. But this, this is kind of thing is a great example of the things we should be doing. So automatic retries, um, fairly full functionality when you're disconnected and just a clear message saying when you're offline and showing people what does and doesn't work. Um, so is it worth it? This is the, the caveats bit. We're going to go into some of the harder stuff. So um, forms are pretty simple. Multiplayer forms like chat are a little bit harder. Um, static pages, we should all definitely do, because that's just dead easy. But there's some hard stuff. Conflict resolution, for example. So real-time multiplayer forms, like Google Docs. Um, this is, I, I don't know if they call it Docs or Drive now, but this is in Google Drive. You can have a bunch of people editing the same document. And obviously, that gets very complicated. If you go offline and make a bunch of changes and then reconnect, then something's going to happen. And we hopefully all know this is complicated. Google knows it's complicated because when I tried to set up the demo video showing conflicts in Drive, I just opened two tabs on my laptop with the same document open, and then one of them I emulated offline mode. And then I got this message. It's the longest error message I've ever seen in one of these little yellow boxes. It basically just says you've got an open tab on this computer already. Um, you can't go into offline mode in both tabs, so close one of them. So they wrecked my demo and experiment, and I had to close the tab. Um, so what I ended up doing was having 
one thing on my computer and the other one on my phone and then putting the computer offline and then editing on that and then editing on my phone. And that looks something like this. So this is me editing on the computer and I've made some changes on my phone and saved them. And now my computer's reconnecting to Wi-Fi and it's gonna get the phone's changes and just try to resolve them. And this is what we get. Just dumps everyone's text in a row. And there's not really a lot that you can do here. Like conflict resolution is going to be hard. Either that or you need to show someone kind of a, a message saying, you know, you need to fix this. So someone will need to resolve this. And it can get harder than that. This is just adding text. So just adding is fine. You just dump the text together and they fix it. Uh, if you delete text, so this was, I deleted the word hard on my phone and then I started editing on this. And this one was pretty confusing. I don't know entirely what happened, but then when it reconnected, then it just deleted H-A-R and kept the D and got rid of a space. So they're doing something here. But basically, it's really complicated, and you probably don't want to go into this. If you're doing real-time docs, then try the locked editing mode of the first Google example and save yourself a world of pain and hurt. Another challenge is testing. So manual testing is straightforward enough. We all know how to disconnect our computers from the internet, and you just refresh the page and test stuff works. But for automated testing, that's a bit harder. So if we've got kind of the... Uh, Selenium or other type tools or Puppeteer or things like that, then we usually, we send a bunch of commands, we say, you know, load this page and then do stuff. Um, but amazingly, Puppeteer now has support for, you'll say, go to this page, this is saying load a page and then wait until the service worker is ready. So this is the first time you visit a page, you'll install the service worker. My page is now ready to work offline. So I can then go set offline mode and then reload the page. And this, using Puppeteer, should now put me into my offline page. Um, this is pretty good. I think it's only available with Puppeteer, so I don't know of other ones that do it. Um, but it's kind of, like, beyond this, it's pretty straightforward to test. Unfortunately, other than only being available for Puppeteer, um, this currently doesn't work. There's a bug for, for this exact thing that's a confusing thing of its, it'll just load the actual page content and it ignores online, it's a whole thing. This will be fixed in, I don't know, a month or two and then we'll be able to do it. So it's great that it's possible but it's not possible yet. So automated testing offline is still challenging. And security and auth. This is another tricky part. This is, this kind of affects all of it um, but primarily for if we consider, I'm gonna tell you about my dream. This is what GitLab looks like. This is the, the GitLab source on GitLab. It's like a code hosting repository and it, it has no offline support at all. But I've, I have a dream and my dream is that one day I'll be able to load a repo on GitLab and it'll just have a button saying, you know, make available offline and then I can tick that and it'll just save the code to my local machine and then I can browse that repo when I'm offline. I can view issues. I can do code reviews, I can do all that sort of stuff. Um, but the reason that this is very complicated for products that aren't just your kind of blogs and docs type pages is when you've got users that are logged in and restricted permissions, uh, what would you do if I was to load a private repo and then it caches all of that and then I log out? Then you've got to deal with should you purge all of this information or uh, just tie it to logout and the, the authentication in the first place. You've got to be able to check if someone's logged in and some other complications there. And this is much more manageable. This is easier than the previous problems. So this is a kind of solvable one, but just takes a bit of finessing around how you do auth, remembering to handle logout, deleting stuff, ensuring that people aren't viewing stuff they shouldn't be able to view. Um, there's things like what if you did a form submit while logged in that was getting ready with background sync and then you logged out just when you reconnected. Like what if you can beat the background sync to log out? Should it still be able to send an authenticated request after you've logged out? I don't know. I haven't got that far yet. We'll see. But that's kind of a, again, that one's doable but a bit tricky. So that one would take some thought. And that's, that's the three sections. And I think that offline support is worth it for at least our most basic forms. It's 
you're caching static content, you're giving people instant load times. You can then make fun of people who are still measuring their page load times in seconds, look at them smugly, and just say that your page loads instantly and then gets updates later. And that is the end, far ahead of time. So I will open to questions. Thank you all. <laughs>